Good morning, everyone. I had to check if it was morning or afternoon. Uh, we're at Ohio State, right? So we get to say, OH! Ohio. That was, no, no, that was sad. OH! Ohio. That, was, that was better. Yeah, thank you very much. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ohio State Lima. My name is Maggie Young, and I have the privilege of serving as your interim dean and director. And we are so happy that you can come here and spend the day with us in our labs with some of our college students and now with the keynote speaker for the Stardust William Fowler Science Series 2024. So many of you maybe know a little bit about this series and maybe I've even been here before, but if you haven't, the William Fowler Science Series is a cross-disciplinary program for the community, including local middle and high school students. The Lima City Schools, in collaboration with our outstanding Ohio State faculty and leaders, focus a portion of their fall semester science curriculum to the Fowler Science Series topic each year. Not surprisingly, this year's topic is the total solar eclipse that will happen in just a few short months. The Fowler Science Series is a partnership between Ohio State Lima, the Lima City Schools, and the City of Lima to honor one of Lima's own. While our city may not always be highlighted as frequently as it should be for being the birthplace of renowned artists, selfless leaders, and brilliant scientists, today we delight in calling attention to one of our own. William A. Fowler won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1983 for his efforts to show how all the natural elements in the periodic table are forged under extreme conditions across the course of a star's lifetime. Leading up to his astounding discoveries in physics, Fowler was a graduate of Ohio State, and before that, the Lima City Schools. I look forward to and am beyond excited to see which of you, or better yet, how many of you will follow in his illustrious footsteps. So now it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage the mayor of the city of Lima, the Honorable Sharita Smith. Thank you, Dr. Young, and good morning, students. Good morning. Thank you. Um, it is such an honor to be here with you all today, um, and also a privilege to be born and raised in Lima um, and educated in area schools. And as Dr. Young said, I am also looking forward to see how many Nobel Peace Prize winners we have out here in the audience today. How many of you are interested in a career in science? Show me by show of hands. It's pretty good. You know, science is incredibly important, whether it is keeping our bodies healthy, protecting our environment, or discovering new information. No matter what field of science interests you, or even if your career interests are not directly related to science, we have many opportunities available for you here in Lima. We have fantastic education providers as your local schools, but also the Ohio State University, and many of our industries are science-based as well. So we encourage you, as you listen to today's lecture and you participate in the Fowler series, that you think about how Lima is a part of your story and all of the opportunities that you will have here in this community to put what you learn to work. I also want to thank everyone that made this event possible today. There is a well-known African proverb that says that it takes a village to raise a child. And this really rings true today as we see the room filled with so many people that are invested in the future of you all. The partnership between the city of Lima, Lima City Schools, and the Ohio State University is just one great example about how our, our community collaborates to enhance educational experiences throughout the community. Science is all about questioning and exploring the world around you. So whether you're in middle school or high school, I wanna encourage you to keep learning and to remember that events like today provide a fantastic opportunity to keep growing so that our mind can take full advantage of all that is available to us. Thank you all for allowing me to speak to you today, and I hope you enjoy the series. And now I will invite up Dr. Brian Albright. All 
All right. Well, good morning, all. Uh, my name is Brian Albright. I serve as the Assistant Dean for Student Success, and I work with a lot of people to make this event happen every year, and glad that there was no school delay today. I know maybe some of you were disappointed, but hopefully not, because you get to come to campus, and those that, uh, from the middle school, you were able to participate in some really cool activities with our faculty this morning. But I have the great pleasure this morning to introduce our keynote speaker, Today's speaker is Dr. Wayne Slingman. He is the director of the Arne Settleback Planetarium at The Ohio State University, where he joined the Department of Anatomy in 2024. He received his PhD from the University of Arizona, where he worked with Ed Pather and the Center for uh, Astronomy Education, doing research on the teaching and learning of general education introductory anatomy, uh, astronomy and Yant Shirley studying star formation via dense gas tracers in the Milky Way galaxy. That's a mouthful. Uh, he then went on to work at uh, University of, of Colorado Boulder with general education, non-science major, introductory an, uh, astronomy classes, and the Frisk Planetarium. At Ohio State, he has been working with faculty and students in many departments to fully utilize the exciting technology available in the Full Dome Theater, reaching thousands of students and members of the public. Champion the use of active engagement, learning-centered instructional strategies in public events to engage our public beyond the consumption of information. Dr. Slingman most recently won the 2023 Community Engaged Practice Nears uh, sorry, um, I can't even say it. Uh, practitioner, thank you, mine went blank. Practitioner Award from the Provost Office. Dr. Slingman will explore the deep and continuing fascination we have with the eclipse and talk more about what we can expect from the eclipse heading our way very soon. And welcome Dr. Slingman to the stage. All right, how is everybody? Are we awake? Just kind of? All right. Um, to go off of what the mayor just talked about, I have a couple questions for everybody in the audience. How many of you like art, like, like to draw, like to paint? Raise your hands. Digital, whatever. Awesome. Um, how many of you like music? Raise your hands. Theater. Singing, also, yeah. How many of you um, know what you're going to be when you grow up? Also awesome, guess what? Every single person in this room can work for NASA. I didn't say that you had to study anything. Do you want to know what we need? We need people to do all the jobs at NASA. People have to get paid. These projects are billions of dollars in size. Someone has to keep track of where all that money is. Every single person in this room has skills that are necessary to understand science, convey it to other people in clear and articulated ways and you can do it if you want to. I have a friend who has a PhD in planetary science. He studies the planets in our solar system, and he is paid to go to conferences to draw other people's talks. He's just an artist, and he likes to sketch, and he became famous for that sort of thing. It's really, really cool. So you can have all these hobbies and still be a scientist. So keep with education. This stuff is actually pretty fun. It really is. It's not always just hard stuff and just practice problems. It's really exciting, like what we get to see here coming here in April. All right, so why do eclipses excite us? What's so cool about eclipses? What do you think? Because it's, it's dark. What else? Because yeah, it's kind of rare and you don't see them that much. That's exactly right. Um, well, we, we did see a few of them, but there are multiple types of eclipses, right? But this one is very special because it goes right through here. Notice that Lima is in the center of the map. That's all you guys. There will be upwards of a million people that might come into the state of Ohio to see this event. My brain cannot comprehend what a million looks like, but that's half of the city of Columbus. That is filling the shoe 10 times for football. That's insane. That's huge numbers of people that are coming to see it because we happen to be on totality and we have an interstate. 
So it's super exciting, but we'll talk a little bit more about the timings, but it is happening April 8th, it's a Monday. Y'all know April in Ohio. It's gonna be a clear and dry day with no clouds in the sky. Yeah, I know I'm being a little sarcastic. Anything can happen, right? But no matter what, the sky will go dark. At what time? 3:10. At 310, the sky will go dark. And right before that, you will see a wall of darkness coming at you at 1,000 miles an hour. It's marginally terrifying because if you think about it, like that's weird to look at, but it's really, really awesome because it is an event that we're not going to see again for a long time. All right, so... What is an eclipse? It's when something passes in front of something else and blocks its light. So that's the simple version of it, but we can do an eclipse of all sorts of things. But there are two flavors that we are used to seeing. One is a lunar eclipse, which is where the moon gets dark, and a solar eclipse where the sun goes away. And they can come in both partial and total flavors. So a partial lunar eclipse. Looks like someone got a little hungry, started eating eating cookies, right? Like this is, this is the cookie model of the eclipse. We could hand out Oreos and every single person can eat onto the moon and it's delicious, right? But the moon passes into the earth's shadow and so we see a chunk that's, um, that's taken out of it. But once it gets completely in the earth's shadow, it looks like this. So you might hear this called a blood moon because it's so red. Now, if you are standing behind the Earth on the moon during a total lunar eclipse, what do you think you would actually see? If you were standing on the moon during a total lunar eclipse, what would you see? You wouldn't see the sun. So we're not at solar eclipse yet. We're not there. That's the next, that's the next questions I'm going to be asking. But this is when we're looking at back at the Earth. The earth blocks the sun, except it doesn't, not entirely. What's on the outside of the earth? The atmosphere. And what happens when we trans go from um, daytime into nighttime and make that transition? What happens during that time of day? The sunset, and what color is the sky? It's pink and orange. What color is the moon? Pink and orange. Because when you're looking at the earth, from the moon, all you see is sunrise on one side and sunset on the other side. And all the light that is bent around the earth through the atmosphere is illuminating the moon, which is why it turns red. Now, we can also have a partial solar eclipse. This is where the moon passes between the earth and the sun, and so we block out part of the sun. The moon and the sun are both half a degree on the sky. And if you hold your arm out at arm's length, everybody can do this, and put your pinky up, that's one degree. So you were built in with a protractor. Everybody's good at angles, promise. And we're not gonna do this with the sun, but the next time you see the moon, you can block out the moon with your pinky finger, because the moon is only half the width of your pinky at arm's length. So is the sun. But that means we can block out the entire sun in the sky, and that gives us a total solar eclipse. So this is what's happening on April 8th. We're gonna see the moon completely block the surface of the sun, and then we're gonna see the sun's crown, the sun's corona. Basically, it's part of the solar wind that's streaming away from the sun, and the sky will go dark. The horizon will still be bright pink. We'll talk about that here in a minute. But the sun will disappear for three minutes, and then it will come back. So you were right in saying that it's a very rare event. So why do eclipses happen? We're gonna watch a little video that explain this. Have you ever wondered what causes eclipses? Every year, the Earth goes around the sun Every month, the moon goes around the Earth. Every day, the Earth turns on its axis. Hey, slow that down. The moon shines because it reflects the light of the sun. It doesn't produce its own light. Half of the moon is always lit up by the sun. 
Watch its motion during a month. You see that half the moon is always lit. But during the month, more or less of that lighted side can be seen from Earth. And we call this changing appearance the faces of the moon. Watch again. See how it looks from Earth. The full moon is opposite to the sun, and so it always rises about sunset. Did you ever notice that? At the new moon, the moon is in the direction of the sun. The side of the moon facing us is dark. Also, because the moon rises and sets with the sun, the new moon is only up during daytime and never up at night. However, Every year, there are times when the new moon can block all or part of the sun, creating a solar eclipse. At full moon, the moon can pass through the Earth's shadow, causing a lunar eclipse. Notice that everyone on the night side of the Earth can see the lunar eclipse. For that reason, lunar eclipses are not so rare. You might wonder, why isn't there a solar eclipse every new moon? And why isn't there a lunar eclipse every full moon? This is because the moon's orbit is tipped about 5 degrees compared to the Earth's orbit around the sun. We've made the moon bigger, so you can see better. If we show Earth and moon to scale, you'll see how small the shadow of the moon is by the time it reaches Earth. So more often than not, the moon's shadow misses Earth when it is new, and Earth's shadow misses the moon when it is full. Roughly twice a year, eclipses are possible. The Earth's orbit around the Sun and the moon's orbit around the Earth are not perfect circles. They are slightly oval. There are times when the new moon is farther from Earth and is too small to completely block the sun. During an annular eclipse, there is a ring of fire around the sun. By the way, when the moon is closer to the Earth than average, some call it a supermoon, though 5% bigger isn't exactly super. If a solar eclipse happens when the moon is closer to the Earth, we call it a total eclipse. You can only see amazing phenomena like pink prominences at the edge of the sun and the beautiful solar corona stretching across the sky if you are viewing from the path of totality. If we zoom in to see the moon's shadow, you'll see that it has a dark part and a lighter part. If you are standing in the dark part, you are in the path of totality. The sun is completely covered, and you will see a total eclipse. In the lighter shadow, some part of the sun can always be seen, so you see a partial eclipse. A lot of people think that if you see a 90% eclipse, you've seen most of the show. No way! The sun is so bright that even a sliver of it keeps the sky lit, and you'll miss the most awesome stuff. If you possibly can, go into the path of totality. You'll remember it for the rest of your life. Visit the website www.colorado.edu slash Fisk. So that was put together by my friends at Fisk Planetarium where I was able to do my postdoctoral fellowship. Um, they had just remodeled and it got me into planetariums. It was a pretty cool place but they specialize in doing scientific visualization there, and so that's why they have these really great videos. So, we only get eclipse seasons twice a year. So that means every single year it's possible to have a lunar and a solar eclipse, either in the spring or the fall or the summer or the winter. They're about six months apart from each other, and it's because the moon is pretty tiny, and because of its tilt, that, that shadow always misses us. So it's only when they're able to be completely lined up, like we can see at the top and bottom of this diagram here, that we can actually get an eclipse. 
This is a map of all the eclipses that happened in the last 20 years. These are all of the um, total eclipses where the sun is completely blocked, and the annular eclipses, the one where you get the ring of fire. There was one of those just last year in October, went through the western United States. But you can see that it doesn't cover a huge part of the world. There's not a whole lot of places that get to see those total solar eclipses. And we can see the blue one that cuts through the United States over there. That was our 2017 total solar eclipse. And then you can see what's happening for the next 20 years. Most of them don't intersect with the United States or even North America. So these events are pretty rare. And that's what makes them so incredibly special. Because the chance of you being in the same place, like Evan, is it Evanston, um, Illinois, at the very bottom that gets the 2017 eclipse and the 2024 eclipse, that's pretty rare to have that within about five years of each other. So it's because of the rarity and because they're such a small place. Like you can be in Ohio. Like if you're in Columbus, you're going to miss the total solar eclipse because it doesn't pass through Columbus, it goes through here. So y'all are, are pretty, pretty special to be on the, the line of totality. So what can we expect? Well, the last annular eclipse in Lima was in 1994. So that was a ring of fire eclipse. And the previous one before that was 1838. The next one is 2093. I will likely not be alive in 2093 unless we have some really good medical advances. Um, the last total solar eclipse in Lima was in 1806. How long has that been? Over 200 years since we last had a total solar eclipse. And the next one is only in 2099. The next eclipse that will happen in the United States is 20 years out. So these type of events are pretty spectacular. And once you've seen one, you're never going to try to miss another one. I didn't know exactly what to expect for 2017. It was my first eclipse and I was blown away by the entire experience. And this eclipse is longer, and the sky will be darker. So it's a spectacular event for us to happen. So what does this look like? We talked about the shadow of the moon on the Earth. This right here is a picture taken from the International Space Station of the 2017 eclipse, and you can see the shadow on the Earth. But it's only at the very center of that that the sun is completely gone. And the closer you are to the center, the more uniform the sky is and the darker it gets. But what are we going to see on the day of? We're going to see the sun come out in the morning. There will probably be clouds because it's Ohio. We can never get clouds, not have clouds. So the sun is going to come out and there'll be clouds in the sky. It's going to look like any other day. When the moon starts passing in front of the sun, we're going to see a little like a nibble taken out of it. It's just like eating a cookie. Cookie monsters going after the sun. Um, it's delicious. The sun is made of lemons, so we go with that, right? But we'll be able to start to see this, and if you're just doing stuff outside, you will not notice anything different. It's not until we get deeper into the eclipse and we start to see the sun shaped like this that things start to change. The shadows change. The sky will start to look a little bit weird because it's starting to get darker than what we're used to. And you're like, wait a second. Is something, something wrong here? It's like the lights are only half on. And then we get deeper into a crescent. Now everything looks weird. Animals start going to sleep. Nocturnal animals start waking up. It starts to get cold. Your brain is still like, it's pretty bright outside, but it starts to get really cold because you're not having any energy from the sun. 90% of it is now blocked. And it starts to feel like, like we're having a seance with very dim lighting because it starts to get dark and dim and it's really crazy until we hit the main event. This is when you get to take your glasses off. Glasses on, glasses off. If you can see any part of the sun's surface, you can't take your glasses off, it's not safe. But as soon as this happens, you can enjoy this for three minutes here. What we're looking at here is the sun's corona. This is the outer atmosphere of the sun that's streaming out through the solar system. 
and it can change shapes depending on how active the sun is, and we'll look at that here in a second. But the other thing that they talked about in the video is you might be able to see part of the sun's surface, the chromosphere. This is the sun's outer layers of gases that are looping out, and they get really big when we're in a high level of solar activity, which we are currently in. But we might be able to see some of those edges sticking out the side, the side of the moon, along with the stuff streaming out. So that's what you can expect to be able to see on the day of. Yes, the sun is still tiny in the sky, but there will probably be people with telescopes around that you might be able to look at um, safely. They have special filters that go over the front, and you can see um, different parts of the sun before the eclipse happens. This is a picture I took, very terrible, um, but I happened to be in Wyoming with my parents for the 2017 eclipse, and this was what the horizon looked like. It looked like dusk on the horizon, and we could see all the planets that were out and a few bright stars up in the sky. We're going to be able to see the constellation of Orion up in the sky with the sun being blocked during the day. And most of you know what Orion looks like, so you'll be able to find that. And it'll happen in the middle of the afternoon. It's going to be really, really cool. So nothing can prepare you for what this is like because it is so different than everything else you've experienced because this is all directions. This is 360. This isn't like sunset. It's on the west side of the sky. We're good. It's also a really good time for us to be able to do some science. So when you block out the brightest thing in the sky, you can see all the other faint things. So the moon is creating what astronomers would call a coronagraph. It's blocking out everything so we can just see the corona. Astronomers do this all the time when we want to study extrasolar planets, and we block out the light of the star and see if we can take a picture of the planets. So we're blocking out the things, and we are blocking out the main part of the sun so we can see all the faint stuff that's kind of interesting. NASA sends out airplanes to chase down eclipses. We're looking for how the sun, when it's erupting on the surface, which it's constantly doing, can send out pulses through the solar corona. That helps us understand the solar wind and how energy is transmitted from the surface of the sun out into the solar system. We also can study the Earth's atmosphere. This is something that we do at Ohio State in um, Earth science, is we study the atmosphere of the Earth. And right here, we're looking at waves in the upper atmosphere, in the ionosphere. So usually, the upper atmosphere is hit by ultraviolet radiation from the sun. It's the same stuff that gives us sunburns, but very little of it ends up reaching towards the surface of the Earth. So that's why it's a good thing to have this atmosphere. But we want to study how that radiation can hit the atmosphere, knock electrons off of their atoms, and then they can come back together again when there's no more ultraviolet radiation. So an eclipse is a perfect time to see exactly how that comes together and the shock waves that can ripple through the upper atmosphere as those occur. So we can learn about our own planet. When it comes to planning, this is for 2017. This right here, that's the path of totality. What do you think doesn't happen in the dark area? Where do we get energy from? Where's a big place that we can get energy from anymore? Solar. If you're missing all of the solar energy, you have to plan for that. So the planning that goes into eclipses and studying exactly where things will be on, where things will be off, and how to get energy to everybody is pretty critical to understanding those things. But it also gives us a really good chance of studying the upper parts of our atmosphere that we don't normally see. Because during the day, the sky is bright and we don't get to look at that part of the atmosphere. So we can see how it responds in sunlight, how it responds when that immediately goes away and then immediately comes back. So we can do a lot of experiments. And I bring this picture up because we can see that there are different layers of the atmosphere that might glow in different colors. What have you seen before that glows in different colors? The Northern Lights. The sun is reaching a peak in its solar activity, which means more sunspots, more solar eruptions, more times when it's dark outside that Ohio can see the Northern Lights because these are big storms that are happening. And this is basically that chart of the next solar cycle. So you can kind of see that we're still rising in all of that. But the difference in what the way the sun looks when we're at solar maximum, the corona changes shape. So we can study what it looks like when it's at solar minimum there on the left and what we're probably going to see over here on the right. A lot more activity, and we might see eruptions from the sun. I don't know if we can see big enough eruptions with our own eyeballs. That could be really exciting. I don't know. But if something like that also hits the Earth on the same day, it's dark outside. 
in the middle of the afternoon. And the atmosphere will receive all of that, all those particles and get excited and potentially glow. So there's all sorts of things that we might be able to see. The aurora might light up while we're out there watching the eclipse. That would be a wild experience because I've never seen the aurora borealis either. But this is a high resolution picture taken of the sun's surface in the colors of what we call hydrogen alpha. So it's the specific crayon that corresponds to all the hydrogen in the universe when it's hot. So the sun glows in it, but we can see all those eruptions on the surface. So this is what we see lifting up above the edge of the moon and gives it that pink color when we're looking at the edges. And for those of you that have not seen the aurora before, this is what it looks like. There have been events this winter already where we could have seen it in Ohio if it was clear, because if they can see it in Arkansas and get beautiful pictures, then we could have had a really great show, but those were cloudy nights. Um, but if we keep paying attention to it, these are the types of things that happen all the time. The sun is always there, and they're available for us to be able to see. So one of the things I just want to go over, and it's because I want everybody to be safe when we're watching the eclipse, is a little bit of eclipse safety. You can either go to NASA's website or you can go to the American Astronomical Society. Um, that is the AAS. And you can see this page. It has this information on it. But there are certified eclipse glasses out there that are safe. Are sunglasses good enough to block out the light from the sun to see the eclipse? Absolutely not. There is no part of sunglasses that block out enough light where it is safe to look at the sun ever. So sunglasses don't count. But the special eclipse glasses that you can get do. And the best way to put them on is to not look at the sun. The sun is up here, right? So you put them on your face, and then you look up at the sun because you don't ever want to have it catch. Like every once in a while, yes, the sun flashes through our eyes, whatever. But we're going to be doing that a lot on the day of. And you don't want to be hitting your light with basically a magnifying glass and burning ants, you know, bad things, to your eyeballs because you need your eyeballs for the rest of your life. So we want to be careful. Glasses on until the sun is completely obscured. And then once it's um, completely covered by the moon, then you can take them off and you can observe that for three minutes while the eclipse is going on. And then you have to put them back on as the edge comes back on. Even my parents' dogs will wear their glasses. They were wearing our old Ohio State glasses from 2017. So they're all prepared. They're ready to do the eclipse. They totally went to sleep as soon as it started getting dark. They just wanted to curl up in a blanket and go to bed. But another thing, let's say you don't have glasses. You can make a pinhole camera. A pinhole camera. Take a piece of cardboard, poke a hole in it. You now have an eclipse viewer. And that's what they're doing here. You can use a colander. So like where you'd make spaghetti, you can line that up with the sun and you can see all the shadows. You can use a slotted spoon. You can use your fingers. You can use a pinhole. If the leaves are out early enough, we'll be able to see this on the ground. Remember where I said things don't get weird until we start to see the crescents? Because once the sun starts looking like a crescent, all the shadows stop being circles on the ground and looking fuzzy because we don't actually think about that very often. But instead, all the shadows, because all the little holes in the trees make pinholes on the ground. And so you see thousands upon thousands of little crescent suns. So it's going to be really, really great. There's also other things that are really hard to see. Um, there's a whole phenomenon called shadow bands. So right before the eclipse happens, if you look at the ground, you're going to see what looks like snakes going all over the place. And there are ripples in the atmosphere that are causing the shadow of the, sun, of the moon and the sunlight to intermix with each other. And it looks like the whole ground is just moving. It's quite, cr quite crazy. Um, so when you're, when you're out there with the eclipse, you want to be looking up, you want to be looking down, you want to be enjoying the entire experience around you. And with that, I can leave the information that we all need. It starts about 2. That's when the sun is starting to be covered. About 3 is when totality happens. By 3.15, we're done. And then hell breaks loose, and everybody gets on the road, and we're going to find out how well Ohio has planned for this. <laughs> But if you want this map, you can always go to um, this website. This is NASA's website with all the maps on it. And you can also send me questions, if you have questions, to solareclipse at osu.edu. 
So let's start with some questions because I can talk about a lot of things. Yes? There is a comet that's coming in, and it might be visible during the eclipse as well. Um, the comet is still coming into the solar system, if I remember right, and so it is, we don't know how bright it will be. But if it has a, an event where all of a sudden it builds up a big tail or starts glowing very brightly, it'll be easy to see while it's near the sun because the sun will be blocked, and we'll be able to see some cool stuff. I have a question for you all. How many porta potties do you think are in the state of Ohio? And why do you think I know this information? 10 billion? 60 billion? 110. I, I, think, I, th I think Ohio State uses about 110 per parking lot for football games. There are 52,600 porta potties in the state of Ohio. And this is relevant because we have to move them from all the places that they are into the path of totality. So that way people can use the restroom. I've been on the Eclipse Planning Task Force. We've been active for about four years trying to plan for this event, trying to figure out how we move people, how we make sure that medical facilities stay open, plan with schools, highways, all this stuff. So it takes a lot of effort, and it takes a lot of people, people that I would have never worked with otherwise. So all of you, again, that are going out to interesting jobs, doing cool stuff, staying in Lima, that you all get to participate in huge events like this because we all have to come together in order to plan and make sure that these things turn out really good. So it's kind of cool. Yeah, question. You can use certain kinds of welding helmets. You have to, so you'll have to go to the AAS or NASA's webpage to look up the exact specifications, but there is a certain darkness of welding glass that will allow you to look at the sun, but it's not a typical welding glass. So just the one that might be at home, you need to double check because you need the stuff that's darker. Yeah, white shirt. Um, glasses, Ohio State is still working on their order at the moment, so I don't have any glasses with me but I think some of the schools might, but there is still time to, to order glasses online. Small amounts, yeah. You don't want to do that. Have you ever played with a magnifying glass and the sun? You don't want to do that with your eyeballs. Do you want to have cooked eyeball and have your eyeball fall out of your head? No. You'll want those because you want to play video games, and you have to have your eyeballs in order to see the video game. Yeah. So the best spot to view the eclipse is a place where you can see maybe a larger area of the sky. Like if you're caught in a bunch of trees, I know that um, early April is not a time when most of the trees are leafed out, but if they are, you want to be away from that because you want to be able to see the sky. Um, I would say that if you can have a park that's near your home where you don't have to get on the road, that's probably going to be advantageous. Um, but basically any place that you can see it will be good. And the reason I say that is because there's going to be a lot of people moving up and down the interstates, and you could easily get stuck, you know, maybe 10 miles away for five hours, waiting just to get on the road and then try to get home. Because there could be a lot of people moving. We're looking at Pittsburgh and Detroit, because they'll be coming down here all of Detroit will be feeding into this northeast part of Ohio. And Toledo's only on the very edge, so they don't get the whole show. So you go to Lake Erie. So I, well, yes, there are people who are going in the middle of Lake Erie. In Colorado in 2017, most of the people that left Denver never made it to Wyoming because there was no more place to put cars in Wyoming. So they just stopped on the interstate and sat there all day waiting because there was nothing to do. They couldn't go anywhere. So that's why we tried to plan ahead. Yeah, question. A slight feeling of less gravity? It's minor. But whenever the moon and the sun are on the same side of the earth, you will see higher tides. So um, tides change based on the phase of the moon. So when the moon and the sun are on the same side for new moon or on opposite sides for full moon, you can get higher tides, so that's ocean tides typically. But you and I are feeling tides every day too, we just don't notice it, but we are lifted up about six inches every day, and we go down about six inches every day. All of us. 
You just never feel it. But the earth, like the ground that we're standing on, lifts up and goes down due to the same tides. So the rest of that, while you could measure it with very precision equipment, you're not going to measure it because you feel lighter. Sorry. That would be great, though. Other questions? No, these are all over the time, all over the place, because so the, the moon's orbit is tilted, and when it crosses the plane of the Earth and the Sun, that's when we can have eclipses. But that whole thing rotates very slowly. So um, this year it happens to be in April, but um, so April and like October from last year. But our previous eclipse was August, so that just slowly moves, and it's also exactly when the moon lines up. Um, sometimes the moon is too far away, and so we get the annular eclipse or weird things. And this time we're going to have a super new moon. So the reason that the eclipse is longer and it will be darker outside is because the moon is actually going to be really close to us. So the full moon will be farther away. And there will, I think there is a lunar eclipse. I'm not sure if it's visible in Ohio. I'd have to look that up. Right before the solar eclipse or right afterwards. So we'll see that. But it's going to be one of those micro full moons because it's closer to us during the, the new moon, during the eclipse. Yes? Other planets can have eclipses. Um, one that you can probably see through a telescope, if, because it happens, and I've seen it through a telescope, um, but Jupiter. Jupiter has four big moons called the Galilean moons, and Io goes around Jupiter once every two days. And you can go through and you can watch the shadow of Io and other moons go across the face of Jupiter. And if you were standing on Jupiter, if you could, or if you were floating in a spaceship above Jupiter at that spot, you could see the shadow go over you and the moon would block the sun entirely. So it would be eclipsed. It's pretty cool. Yeah. So planetary alignments are just happenstance. It's how many times they've gone around, and then you just see them all on one side of the solar system for the most part. Um, but it would just be a cool thing to look at. That's it. There's nothing special. It wouldn't change or break the solar system, sadly. Other questions? Things you want to know about? We don't have to talk about the eclipse only, too. Yeah. Oh, so, um, so like the, the maximum totality that we could possibly get is seven and a half minutes? Yes. So that has to deal with how close the moon is to us. If the moon is at its absolute closest, at its what we call perigee, its closest point to the Earth, um, then that would be the biggest moon that we would have in the sky. It would block the most light from the sun and would give us the longest eclipse possible. But then if it's, it's farthest away, then we're going to see the moon as smaller than that half a degree. It doesn't block the whole sun. The rest of it is sort of just, you know, the moon is constantly moving at a pretty quick speed. That's why you see that wall of darkness coming around. Moon's moving, the earth is turning. It doesn't give up, it's relentless. Yeah. So they can go up by a couple feet. So if you look at um, like the highest tides that we get every year, um, around, the earth, around the world um, will be a few feet higher in, a few, in some places than they are normally. And then when the moon is at 90 degrees to the sun, we get what we call um, neap tides, and they're the lowest that we usually see. And so in instead of going up and down a few feet, they might go up and down you know, a foot or less. Kind of depends on, that's where ge geography does play a role in how tides they are, but um, you can see the changes. It's a good thing to look up. You can look up tide tables. Does anybody have plans for the eclipse? Do you know what you're going to do? Yeah, you're going to go out and watch it. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're not going to miss this. You better have plans. Yeah, in the back. Where are you going? Nice. Sounds like a good place to be. Questions? If the sun was what? 
I can't hear that last word. So this, if the sun were hot and blue, we would not be here, period, um, because it would be too much light and the earth would cook us. So if we were doing this, all it would be is that the sun would look hot and blue, and if it were the same size and the moon was in the same place, then you would just change these pictures to instead of having that sort of yellowish sun to a bluer sun. Kind of like when we go from like, um, lights, when you see that color temperature on LED lights where you have the really bluish ones that are kind of weird to the warmer ones that remind us of the old-fashioned um, incandescent lights that are brown, like sort of oranger, it would just be that sort of color difference. Yeah? How do gas giants form? I love it. So now we can talk about how the solar system formed. And for anybody else, stop me if we're, we're hitting time or anything. But the solar system started originally as an enormous cloud of gas and dust in the Milky Way galaxy. So the galaxy that we live in is called the Milky Way, and it's filled with hundreds of billions of stars, as well as huge gas clouds. And that's what I studied as, a, um, as my PhD thesis, was how gas clouds turn into stars. Well, gas clouds have a lot of mass. It's kind of like clouds in the sky, right? they just out there. And then something triggers them to start collapsing, whether this is a shock wave from a star that exploded or they bump another gas cloud, but it just takes a tiny little push and they can start condensing. So it's kind of like you put a cold soda out um, in the fog and you can see that all of a sudden all the water droplets start forming on it. Well, a similar type of thing, gravity is constantly squeezing these things, but once you have this whole thing start, then they will fracture into smaller clumps that will then collapse into stars. So as the gravity keeps pulling together, that cloud, which was originally kind of just doing its own thing, will start to take on a spin because it conserves what we call angular momentum. Now we use this every day for staying up on a bicycle and doing a lot of really cool stuff in airplanes, but angular momentum is, has to be conserved. So it starts spinning faster and faster as it contracts and that allows it to start forming a disk. And then in that disk at the center is the star and outside in the disk, planets can start to coalesce. And so our gas giant planets had to form far out in the solar system because they're made of all the same stuff that formed the sun, whereas the Earth-like planets are only made of the rocky materials that could withstand the high heat of the inner solar system. And so that's why there's a difference between our Earth-like planets and our Jupiter-like planets. Is there questions over here before I go back? You're asking really great questions. I don't want to stop you, but I want to make sure other people can ask questions too. I can pick, yes. Awesome. You guys are gonna get glasses, really cool glasses. See, there you go. See, we are prepared. Any other questions on this side? All right, go ahead. So I would need 80 Jupiters to get it to the minimum sized star. But if it started, if we found 80 Jupiters, let's just say that we did this, okay? Like find Jupiters like Legos and we stack them all together and they squish into a star. When they become a star, the transition between being sort of like a brown dwarf, which is a failed star, a gas giant planet, which is Jupiter, and then becoming a star, what makes them a star is when they start to create their own energy due to nuclear fusion in its core. So it would basically just start creating its own energy and start glowing. So it wouldn't happen in our solar system. There's not enough mass to put that together but there are solar systems that have two stars in them. And so you can have a big star like our sun and a really tiny other star, and then you can even have planets orbiting the outside of them. How many of you have seen Star Wars? Okay, there was a whole side of the room that all of a sudden raised their hand. Have you guys seen Star Wars? Never seen Star Wars. Okay, well, I recommend watching Star Wars sometime. Um, but Tatooine is real. We have found multiple Tatooine systems. That is where you have two stars that orbit each other really closely. That's what we call a binary star system with circumbinary planets. So that means there's planets on the outside of the two stars. 
where you can get two sunsets and two sunrises every single day. Those things exist. Yeah. I don't know the names of the biggest black holes, but I know that, so to go on to big black holes as we kind of skate around the eclipse stuff, um, there is a supermassive black hole at the center of every galaxy. There are hundreds of billions of galaxies that we have seen with our telescopes. So there are hundreds of billions of supermassive black holes in the universe. Let, them, let that just be slightly terrifying for a minute. But the biggest ones are tens of billions times the mass of our sun. 10 billion stars squished into a black hole. They're huge. But their event horizon, the edges of the black holes, where you'd have to be going the speed of light to escape. Basically, if you fall inside, you're done. You would never escape, even if you were a light beam. But those edges would be larger than our own solar system. They're bigger than the orbit of Pluto. So they're actually really, really big compared to Earth sizes, but they're incredibly tiny compared to galaxies, because galaxies are much larger than solar systems. Galaxies are hundreds of thousands of light years across. So that means it takes light hundreds of thousands of years to cross, where it only takes light hours to cross the solar system. So the difference between 100,000 years and a few hours is huge. Yes, question? Yeah, it's like... I am a radio astronomer, yes. I have been to the VLA a number of times. I have not taken data with the VLA, but I have observed with the Green Bank Telescope out in West Virginia that you all can drive to. It's like seven hours away. And you can go to the largest, yeah, you get your family to go down there. You could do steam trains and see the most state-of-the-art radio observatories that were dated in the 60s, but they're still the most state-of-the-art equipment in the world built in West Virginia. But it's the largest steerable structure on land. It's 500 feet tall and it can point anywhere in the sky. It's really cool. Yeah. So science related wise, I guess the most interesting thing that I've ever seen um, is anything that makes you go, huh, right? What is the sound of science? What is the thing that we all put in our brains? I got it, right? I understand it. That's boring science. That's way after way after the sound of real science. Real science is when you go, that ain't right. And then you go back through your data, you figure it out, and you still look at it, no, that's real. That ain't right, because that's when you learn something new. That's when you have to dig into it, and you get to discover something for the first time. Now, one of the things that's kind of come online starting, I think, next year is when it has first light, is the Vera Rubin Observatory. And since the United States is the founding partner, and we funded the majority of the observatory, all of its data is available for free to all of you the night it comes off the telescope. It's a five gigapixel camera, so something way larger than what's in your cell phone. It's huge. And it takes pictures of the sky every single night in the southern hemisphere. And there's even an entire constellation that's reserved for the public that astronomers are not allowed to go in and use the data from because it's reserved for citizens to do science and do really cool things with. So if you want to make discoveries, this is something that literally you can go home after school and start sitting down at the computer and making your own astronomy discoveries. So it's really cool. Yes, question. Why don't those planets come so they are not large enough to cause any total blockage. That is why we don't call them eclipses. But we do see transits of other planets. So there's two planets that are interior to the Earth, Mercury and Venus. Mercury passes in front of it of the sun fairly regularly. But Venus, we saw the last one for about, I think it's 400 years, in 2012. So we have to wait a long time, and then we'll see two transits of Venus within like five years of each other, and then we wait another 400 years. But it's only because we have our two interior planets. I see your question. It's in your brain. Yeah. I know you have a question. Oh, you don't? I know she does, yeah. What's your question? Oh, that one's hard. 
um, which scientist has had the most significant discovery in science. So the hardest part about a lot of this is that a lot of our older scientists, really before the last century, were all one type of person. They were all pretty wealthy and they knew how to write and they published their own books. So we don't know which scientists did a lot of the science that really broke things and really changed the way um, everything worked or the way we understood the world. Instead, we know who wrote it down. So it's hard to say really who, who did that sort of thing. But there have been a lot of amazing astronomers in the 20th century, so you know the last 100 years, 1900s to 2000, that changed our universe. Because at the beginning, in 1900, the universe was our galaxy. And our galaxy included the nearest thousand stars. That was it. And we grew it to the size of the current universe, which is 14 billion light years out to the edge from what we can see. So we went from what we see in the night sky all the way out to the size of our current universe. We learned that what we're made of makes up 4% of our current universe. So we don't know what 96% of our universe even is. And these are all relatively recent discoveries. So it's hard to say, like, what is, what is more groundbreaking? The fact that, hey, this person um, was able to figure out the temperature sequence of stars, or we found out that pulsars were not alien civilizations, or maybe the first exoplanet that detects life. Is that more profound than bringing the universe from this tiny little thing, like knowing that Lima exists, to all of a sudden the whole world exists? That's an amazing thing in its own right, so it's hard to tell. This will have to oh. be the last question. All right, last question. Who wants the last question? Ooh, someone I haven't had back there. So can planets rain different types of water? Yes. So a lot of these extremely hot exoplanets that might be around blue stars or really close to their stars can rain out liquid metal, like iron droplets that will come out of it, or rock that has melted. So it'd be like magma raindrops, lava raindrops. Great question. If you have any more questions, I will take them via email. You all can email me. It's totally fine. But a good place that you can just easily get a hold of me is right here. So remember that. Let's give Dr. Slingman another round of applause. And for a token of our appreciation for being our keynote speaker, a partying gift, thank you so much. If you would like to hear from Dr. Slingman again, he is going to present tonight, this evening at 7 p.m. in the Galvin Cloyd Commons. Uh, it is part of our Eclipse Science Series at 7 p.m. So if you want to tell your parents, uh, he will be back here tonight, this evening, presenting more information about the upcoming eclipse.